We're going to be talking about some interesting facts about King uh, Messiah, uh, Manasseh. And uh, it's amazing some of the things the Lord puts in the Bible He wants us to know and understand. It's profitable for us to study. I love studying the Bible. I hope you do too. In 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verses 11 through 17 is where we'll be. In verse 11, the Bible says, Wherefore the Lord brought upon the captains of the hosts of the kings of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before God of his fathers. And he prayed unto them, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem, unto his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Amen. Now after this, he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gilhan, and in the, in the valley, even to the entering of the fish gate, and compassed about Ophel, and raised it up, a very great height, and put the captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. And he took away the strange gods and idols out of the house of the Lord, and the altars that he had built in um, the mount of the house of the Lord, in, in, and in Jerusalem, and cast them out of the city. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places yet unto the Lord their God. God only. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for getting us here tonight safely, Lord. Thank you for the folks that are here. Thank you for the sweet spirit that we have. Lord, we just thank you for this love in church. I ask you to help us tonight uh, navigate your word, navigate this message that I've studied, Lord. Let it be something to be profitable for your people, Lord. Help them grow spiritually, Lord. Get closer to you, and you get all the glory and honor, Lord. We're so thankful for all that you do. In your Son, Jesus, most precious name we pray. Amen. Now, King Manasseh was one of the pictures he kind of paints this picture of someone that's living a very rough life and and not doing the things of God I mean he was really out in the weeds as far as what I would call him and he was living the way he wanted to live out in a mess is truly what he was and the Lord got a hold of him by taking him into the captivity there in Babylon and he was taken into the thorns and run through the storm and, and took him to uh, out of his own kingdom and where the Lord could kind of get him alone and he realized he was in trouble and he turned to the Lord. You know, it's kind of one of these things where this actually paints us a picture of God's wonderful grace and how God loves us. And Manasseh shows us that tonight. He really does. And if you remember the things that you've probably heard this before, but Jerusalem at this time or the kingdom of, of Israel had already been broken up into two very distinct areas. You know, you had the northern area and the southern area where they were broken up into. And there's some facts there we should consider tonight. Just You may already know it, but let's just state it again so everyone does understand. But right after King Solomon, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, kind of went awry and they had one bad king after another. Now the interesting thing to remember is the northern kingdom, when that happened after Solomon, they truly never had a good king after that. Every king they had, maybe some was not quite as bad as others, but they were all bad. They all did what they wanted to do. They kept getting worse and worse as time went on and they just was on a downhill spiral. The people there, the children of Israel, the God's chosen people, they were turning their back on the Lord, turning away from what God had had for them. God had laid out blessings for them through many years, and yet the children of Israel there were turning their back on the Lord. Now, the southern kingdom was a little bit different, the kingdom of Judah. Now, the kingdom of Judah had a lot of bad kings, but they really had a few good kings going from when, when Solomon's time was over. Uh, so it wasn't like the northern kingdom where they constantly had more and more bad kingdoms. The northern kingdom truly never had a good king after Solomon. It's kind of a sad, sad, sad situation. It really was.
Manasseh was one of the kings that was extremely bad, and then he repented. I love the fact that the Lord puts this in here for us to understand. He repented in an effort to turn around the destruction that was to come. Now, if you're one of these people that like history and stuff, I, I never cared much for it until I had a really good history teacher one time, and he kind of sparked my interest, and then I liked parts and pieces of history. But tonight, just to consider, King Manasseh actually had took the throne when he was 12 years old. Now, I can remember myself at 12 years old, and I can't imagine being a 12-year-old and being in charge of a kingdom, but he was. He started reigning. His, his time was when he was 12 years old. And he reigned a very long time, considering most of the kings didn't live that long. And uh, with all the wars and things going on, they were always at risk of being killed and stuff and, and stabbed. And it's kind of a funny thing how you know, it's almost like when you're king, you got a target taped on your back, so to speak. But he had reigned for 55 years he would have become king around sometime around 698 B.C. or somewhere in that neighborhood. He was the oldest son of, of, of Hezekiah the king. In 2 Kings chapter 21, we are told Manasseh was a very evil king. And Manasseh, he truly did at that time, he did what was okay in his eyes. Kind of reminds me of the book of Judges. The theme of the whole book of Judges to me is every man did what was right in his own eyes. They just didn't have a real rule of law. They had the law, of course, but they did what they wanted to. So when I think of Manasseh, he did what he thought he wanted to do, and it was very evil against the Lord. Now here's some things that I really want you to get home tonight when you think about Manasseh. Is the Bible tells us that he built up in the high places and the altars and the groves. He created altars of man-made gods, built these altars in the house of the Lord. Now I'm telling you what, if you talk about defiling the temple, he was the man. He did it, he sure did. Building these things inside of God's, God's house is what he was doing. Sure enough, he found a really good way to defile it. Amazing. In 2 Kings chapter 21 verse 5 tells us, It says that he built altars for all of the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He was bringing idol, uh, he was, he was bringing idol man-made gods in, in, into the most holy places of the temple. You know, if you want to offend God, I think he was on a track to really do his best to offend God. If he was trying to upset God, he was doing a really good job at it. He sure enough was. He was so evil that he made his own son pass through the fire. Can you imagine that? Being that evil and mean to make your own son pass through the fire. The Bible tells us that he used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. Boy, he was all out in it, man. I'm telling you what, he really was. He brought so much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke the Lord. Now, when I read my scripture, I don't see where he was truly after to provoke the Lord, but that's exactly what he did. That was what his end game was. He was really getting the, the Lord quite upset at him about this stuff. It seems like he was doing all he could to turn the children of Israel further and further away from God. Those poor people there that was under him in, in, the, in, the, in the area of Judah there, the region of Judah, he was doing everything he could to bring them further and further away from God. Now God had enough of it. He put a stop to it. So if you look with me in verse 11, we see that the Lord had enough of his evil and he had the captains and the hosts of the king of Assyria there to come and take him and bound him into Babylon. Verse 12 tells us that then Manasseh was in affliction. I like the way the Bible puts that. He was afflicted. He was in afflicted. He besought the Lord and, and in, he, dis, he besought his Lord and he humbled himself greatly before the Lord. The Lord gives us these key words in the Bible. He says, greatly. He, what's, it tells me when I see that, that Manasseh made this big change. He had a big change of heart when he was there. And he realized, hey, I'm in trouble. And the only way out of that is turn back to the gods we knew. The God of my father is the only way I'm going to get out of it. All these things that I've made up, all these other gods I've brought into the kingdom, all these other gods I've brought into the temple, the man-made idols and things, they they were not, were not going to help him at all. He turned back to the one true God. He really did. The God of his father is what our Bible calls it. 
In verse 13 it says we see where he prayed to God and God entreated of him. Amen. And heard his supplication. Where God brought him back to his own kingdom there in Jerusalem. This is where the Bible says that Manasseh knew the Lord. He was God. Amen. I can't believe it took him to that point to figure it out. But I'm glad he figured it out sure enough. Before this point. Manasseh had a very hard heart toward the Lord God. He truly did. His heart was full of evil. It was sick. He was wicked beyond recognition. When I think of him, he was a, a picture of wickedness. A very sick, hard-hearted, filled with evil. He was. He was far from God. He was taking everyone with him. It's one thing to be far from God and wicked, but it's another thing when you're driving the bus and you got a whole bunch of people with you. It truly is. That's what he was doing. He was taking the whole kingdom of Judah into this wickedness. Many had said that he did more harm to the kingdom of Judah than most of the other kings. I don't know if that's a fact or not, but he really did a lot of harm to the kingdom of Judah. Manasseh had a very sick and evil heart in need of repair. He really treated His heart was really sick. God's heart was with his people. When you think about what God did for Manasseh, yes, he did it for Manasseh. Manasseh got the benefits of God turning him around by putting him into captivity and setting the man straight or setting the king straight. But when you think about what God did for Manasseh, he was doing that for his own people as well. So turning that king around, making that king into the leader that God had expected him to be, the Lord was doing this for his people as well. This is a good example of why the Old Testament is so badly needed in today's world when you think about it. And why is that? Well, that paints us a picture of God's grace right there. Because if you and I were to think about that tonight in Manasseh, with the way he was so far out in the weeds and so wicked and hateful and mean and so horrible that he would send his own son through the bull or through the fire to, and be just killed doing... Unbelievable. He was so far wicked and yet God saw fit to turn this man around. Amen. So tonight I'll give you five checks that every Christian should have to apply to their heart. When you think about Manasseh here, think about, think about the change that God gave him, the change that he had in his heart where he turned away. The thing that I like about this when I think about this is God had him there in, in captivity there when he was out of his own country. He was probably alone, praying, the, the thing that I love about it is God heard him. When you think about that, God still had a heart for the man. God still had plans for the man. He sure did. God turned, turned his heart around. So five checks every Christian should apply to our heart. Number one tonight, think about Manasseh and think about ourselves. It would do us all good to have a very humble heart. When it comes to the things of God, when it comes to things of what God has done for us, and you and I, when we're around and interacting with other people, it would do us well to have a humble heart. It's kind of one of these things where I'm glad the Lord doesn't have to humble me, if, if you know what I'm saying. I remember back before um, my father got sick, I, I would spend a lot of time at the altar on my knees. And I had someone to ask me one time, how did the tips of my shoes, I had my, the toes of my shoes kind of got a little, little worn. I kept trying to, to put a polish on them and stuff. And I, I didn't really know exactly what was going on with my shoes. But then I realized that uh, the church we were at had this old outdoor carpet on the floor. And that stuff just eats your shoes up. So I was realizing that the tips of my shoes were getting worn by the carpet, which is just fine with me. I kept putting polish on them. But I had someone say, why do you spend so much time at the altar? Well, I love spending time at the altar. I'm the type of person, I'll go to the altar and I, altar and I like to spend time at the altar in prayer because I would rather take my time and spend my time on my knees as opposed to the Lord having to send me to the altar on my knees. There's things in your life that come where the Lord will literally send you to the altar on your knees. He'll send you to your knees. And I'm the type of person, I'd just rather already be there on my knees. The Lord doesn't have to humble me to send me there. Although the Lord can humble me if He needs to. But I want to make sure I humble myself. So you and I tonight, we should be thinking about a humble heart. If the Bible is telling us here that he was able to get right with God by humbling his heart greatly. 
You know, that's a fact right there. You know, any of these lost sinners out here, the ones that are living in pride and filth and living the way they want to live, God is showing us right here, all it starts with is a humble heart. Realizing God is king and he's the creator of everything there ever was created and having going to him with a humble heart. You know, it's the thing about being saved. It's a matter of getting our heart right with God when you think about that. Our heart is changed when we're saved. The Holy Spirit moves into our heart. We have a different heart. We have a different outlook on life. We truly do. But that starts with a humbling heart. It starts with a softening of the heart. It really does. All out through the Old Testament scriptures, the Lord kept gave a giving us warnings about a hard-heartedness. Hard-heartedness is hard to penetrate. When the heart becomes hard, it becomes calloused, it becomes almost unusable for God in God's kingdom. But God turned this man around. He turned King Manasseh around. He truly did. Amen goes there. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 6, the Bible tells us when Peter was writing there, he says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. Amen. That he may exalt you in due time. It's one of these things, if you and I were to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, we don't need anybody to lift us up. We don't need anybody to brag on us. We don't have to brag on ourselves because in due time, we're God's, we're God's man. We're God's woman. We're God's. We're His. He'll exalt us in due time. Not that I need to be lifted up or anything, but God's promised me that. Amen. Isn't that nice to have a promise from the King? Amen. In Philippians chapter 2, verse number 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Amen. Now Jesus' half-brother James wrote in James via the Holy Spirit, in James chapter 4, verse number 6, it says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. I like that. I need his grace. I need to stay humble. My heart needs to be pruned. It's kind of like a peach tree at times. If I have hard areas of my heart, it's kind of one of these things where it's profitable for me to go through and prune these things. You know, a fruit tree a lot of times will not even bear fruit. And if it does bear fruit, it won't bear very good fruit at all if it's not pruned and taken care of. You and I would be careful to make sure that we're, 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 we're humbling our heart. We, we truly would. In Matthew 23, verse number 12, the Bible tells us, And whosoever shall exalt him, himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. You know, a proud heart is a hard heart. Think about that. It truly is. Oh, I don't have a hard heart. Well, if you have a very proud heart, a prideful heart, it's a very hard heart. It really is. Because that heart's grown to itself, if you know what I'm saying. It's focused in on itself. It's not focused on the things of God. It's not focused on the things and needs of people around them. It's focused on himself. That's why God hates pride so much. He really does. God despises a prideful heart. A lot of times we don't think about it, but if we really would, were to really analyze it and think about how de the devil got kicked out of heaven, he got kicked out of heaven because he was so stinking prideful. He thought he was so beautiful and perfect, and the Lord did create him that way. But of course, he thought he should have been the one that should be given all the glory and honor to. That's how he got himself kicked out. Very prideful. He had a big giant head. I'm guessing he still does today. But that's what happened to him. His pride ran away with him. Number two tonight, and this is interesting here, and you might say, Brother Walker, how did you get this out of the Scripture? But it's really there if you pray about it and you think about it. You and I would do well to guard our heart. If we have a humble heart and our heart soft and permeable and usable for God, there's something you and I have to do to make sure it stays that way. We have to guard our heart. We have to keep it away from the things that could cause us to have a hardened heart. We really do. In verse number 14, if you look, we see where Manasseh went and built a wall without the city of David and raised it up to a great height. Now that's an interesting fact. So if you think about your heart and compare it to this city, Manasseh was doing, after he had a big turning around, he was doing what was best to start protecting God's people. He went back to build this wall, build it up high enough. He was building it in a fashion that he was protecting God's people. God's people, God's heart, 
was with his people. He was protecting God's heart because God's heart was on his chosen people. It truly was. Today we have to guard our hearts just like we're building a wall around a city. We truly do. Now, I know we only have a, maybe one or two young, uh, one per, young person in here. That's so important for young people. Because today, on the very tips of their fingers, they have access to everything there is in the world. They really do through a smartphone. And you do as well if you have a smartphone. You and I have to make sure we guard our heart just by the fact that we have access to all this stuff. We truly do. It's very, very important. We've got to be very mindful of the things that, that we have in our hand as well as our young people. We really truly do. Christians should be mindful that the devil will use every tactic to get to your heart. Not only will he get to your heart and make you profitable, he certainly will get to your heart to make it hard and prideful because that's what he's good at. That's what he likes doing. It really does. Amen. Just like Manasseh was doing to the children of Israel before he repented. He was dragging them all further and further in sin. He really was. In Luke chapter 6 verse 45, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart bringeth forth which is evil. For the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Yeah, amen goes there. Sure enough. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 tells us, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Amen. Issues of life start with the heart. You know, if you think about it, what happens in your heart causes you to have problems with jealousy. The things that happen in your heart has, causes you to have problems telling the truth. It's amazing how it's all connected. It really is. In Proverbs 23, verse 26, the Bible tells us, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. God's telling us to let our hearts be His. Because if our hearts is Him and we're focused on Him, then He directs our paths. Amen. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 25 tells us, Let thine heart... Decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. You know, watch your heart. Got to protect it. Where your heart is is where you'll be, believe it or not. It really is. We got to guard our hearts. We truly do. It's important. Wherever your love is, whether it be on a bass boat or an old car or a sports car or whatever, it's amazing. Your bank account. You might have it all wrapped up. You might have your heart wrapped around it. Be careful. we got to be very careful. Guard your heart. God doesn't want these material things and idols in our hearts. He really doesn't. Number three tonight. Be ready to defend your heart. Now, hey, I'm, I'm a type of person, I think we live in a day and era today where we all should have a gun. Amen goes there. I think everybody should have one. If you don't think you should have one, that's fine. Don't get one. But me personally, I think you ought to have a gun. You really truly do. You need to defend yourself. But we need to be ready to defend our hearts. We really do. In verse 14, not only did Manasseh build a high wall, but he put the captains of war over the fenced city. Now that tells me he was ready to defend the city. In the, same, in the same instance there, you and I need to make sure we're ready to defend our heart. We need to be very, very watchful of our family. When we see our family getting tied up or getting close to things that's going to cause them problem and sway their heart because them to have a prideful or a hardened heart, that's when we're to take action. We are to be ready to defend our heart because our heart's with our family as well. It truly is. We need to be ready to defend against the evil. Placing the captains of war over the wall meant that they were ready. Amen goes there. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8, it tells us a little something about the Bible. Peter told us that, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Yeah, he's doing that. That's what he does. That's what he does best. But the good news is he can't be in every place at all times. Amen. So if you know he's messing with somebody else, just think you're safe for a little while. Amen. But be vigilant. We be ready to guard your heart. Be ready to be watchful on these things. We are to be watchful and ready to defend our heart. We truly are. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 14 tells us, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into the angel of light. 
we need to be able to recognize it when He's coming. Amen. How do you do that? Be prepared to guard your heart. Amen. Maybe we need to be setting the captains of war over our heart when you think about it. We, we, we should be ready to do that. We must stay steeped in God's Word just to defend our hearts. That's the biggest defense we have against Satan is being understanding and staying in God's Word. We're focused on what the Bible tells us and the Bible is our main source of all things Scripture related, all things in spiritual matters, all things that pertain to God comes out of this book. We won't have any trouble with Satan's fiery darts. We really won't. We'll be mindful when others come to us and they try to sway us in some direction that's not biblical if we're steeped in the Word. Amen. We'll be guarding our hearts from the fiery darts of Satan. Amen goes there. Number four tonight. Remove distractions that can cause you to lose focus. And this one here goes along with cleaning your heart. In verse 15 we see where Manasseh was quick to take away the strange gods and the idols out of the house of the Lord. He tore down the altars and the fake gods and repaired the altars of God. That's amazing right there. He did some house cleaning. He removed the distractions. He went through and realized that these things meant nothing and got rid of them. That's something that every Christian ought to do at some point in their life is go through their own home and remove distractions that take and pull you away from God. I seen a message one time with this preacher and he was, a, he was quite a character. But he got this big ginormous TV up on the platform with him. Uh, at first and he was preaching along and he was doing a great job. And, he was, and I was just, you know, I was all into it. I, he was, what he was saying was wonderful and I was loving what he was saying. I was amening him. Of course I was watching it online but it didn't keep me from amening him. And I don't know if he would hear me amening him or whatever. But I just kept on and he, I was getting all into his preaching. And he, uh, he kept talking about how... All of us have these things that seep into our homes. you got to make sure that you're building a wall around these things that seep in. And he says, it's all to do with all this media that's brought into our home. And it truly is. We've got to be careful of cable TV. We've got to be careful of the internet. We've got to be careful of what comes in over the airwaves. We really do. And this guy here, he, he puts his, has his TV up on the stage with him. And he, he walks over to this side of the platform. And he pulls out this big ginormous axe. No kidding. It was an axe. It was a fireman's axe. It had a pick on one side and a big old axe head on the other. And he walks right over to that TV, right in front of everybody. And he goes, whamola. I mean, he, he, just, he just burst that TV right there on the platform. And I tell you what, it got their attention. I'm thinking, yeah, that's a really good thing to do. I don't think I could ever pull that off because it would be a huge mess to clean up. But I am guarantee you, if everybody has his way of dealing with distractions, that would be something for us. If you and I went through our homes and there's things that we know that could possibly drag us away from God, if we were to grab a hold of those things and drag them out of the house and throw them in the dumpster, it might do us some good. It really would. Sure enough. Amen goes there. Now it's one of these things where my daddy, he didn't like to see filthy stuff on TV for sure. He really didn't. My daddy, he was a rough character growing up, but if there was anything filthy or anything unclean that he thought, you know, this stuff that we see acceptable today didn't fly in my daddy's house. So if there was something on TV that my daddy thought was not appropriate in any way, it went off. And he told us we wasn't allowed to turn it back on. Yes, I'm glad I had a father that way. He was really careful to make sure that he protected us in ways to keep us from that filth. He truly did. As a Christian, anything can cause you to stumble and needs to be cast out of your heart. Be careful of that, Christian. Be careful of that. It's, tr it's true. Anything that gets in the way of our steps with God, it really has to go. It really does. Trust me on that. It needs to go. Holding bitterness and grudges and, and being hard-hearted towards others is really detrimental to a Christian too. You don't think about it very much. You know these little aggravations in life, even little aggravations with your neighbor, kind of grows in your heart. Got to be careful of that stuff. Got to guard your heart. You got to be very cleansing of the heart to keep these things away. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 31 tells us, Let bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from your 
Put away from your with all malice. Put it away. That's what he's telling us. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 15, it tells us, Look diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. We have to be very careful of our own thoughts and even our own imagination, believe it or not. We have to be real careful to not let evil grow any kind of roots in our own hearts. It's important. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 5 tells us, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I like that fact. You know, the Apostle Paul was telling us there when he was writing to the church in Corinth that, that we have the power to bring those in to obedience, to the obedience of Christ. All those things that we can cast out, he says we have power over our own imaginations. I think a lot of Christians would do real well to focus on what Christ is telling us there. Number five tonight, this is our last one. In 2 Corinthians Chronicles chapter 33, verse 16, And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. You know, when I saw that verse, it said a lot to me. But how it said something to me when I read it and I went back and I read it, it made me really understand that every Christian should set aside time every day to spend with the Lord. You and I really need to be in our prayer closet a lot. We really should. The, the wilds of the world's coming at us left and right. The fiery darts are on us. In the prayer closet, it's probably a safe place for us to be in with the Lord. It truly is. In His care. In His presence when we're praying. Getting away from the things and the things of life. That's an important place for us all to get. Every day, we should be spending time setting aside a time to pray. It's kind of one of these things if you're a busy person. It might be one of these things if you're busy, you just need to schedule a time. Just have it written down somewhere and just set a reminder up that, hey, this is my prayer time. This is where I'm going to pray. And that prayer time could be your Bible time as well. But make sure if you have just Bible reading time and Bible study time on a daily basis, add a little more time to it to pray. One of these things that I love doing on Saturday mornings is, and I've been doing it for so many years, you know, Facebook is used for all kind of weird and evil things and silly things and prideful things and all that stuff. But I've really tried my best. Not that I'm saying that I haven't seen some of that stuff in myself out there as far as the pridefulness and all the selfies and stuff. I don't generally take selfies, but anyway... I try to use Facebook for good, for the good of the Lord. So usually on Sunday mo or Saturday mornings, I'm asking my friends or whoever's my Facebook buddies, I'm saying, what you got going on? Do you have anything I can pray for you on? Now, when I first started that, I was thinking it would be something that would be a real help to them, right, of course. I'm thinking, yes, I just, I'll pray for them. I'll, I'll help them. But I've realized something over the years I've been probably doing it, as long as I've been on Facebook. It's probably been seven, eight years. But I have realized... That's more time I get to spend with the king. If I'm offering to pray for somebody and I'm really diligently praying for them that ask for prayer, it gives me more time with the king. It gives me more time in my prayer closet. I'll be quite honest with you. I'm really busy pretty much all the time. But when I get these prayer requests in from these people that send me prayer requests on Saturday mornings, I always take time for them. Sometimes I don't take enough time for them, but I always take time for them. Matter of fact, I was changing the brake pads on one of the kids' cars and on Saturday morning, and these things come in, and when they pop up and they come in, I got my phone, I know what's going on, and I'll read it, and I'll stop what I'm doing, and I remember Julia caught me out there, I had my head down, I was praying, I had my head under the side of her car, holding on to the brake pads and all that junk, and my hands were dirty, and I was praying to the Lord about whoever sent me the need. But you know what? That was doing something for me. That was helping me. That was giving me time with the king. It truly was. It was giving me time to repair my heart, to give a reset of my heart to the king. Every Christian should be willing to take time on a daily basis to pray, especially pray for others. You know, when we're praying for things that we need, it's important. Yes, we have a lot of needs. We really do. We're needy people. But when we're praying for others, I really honestly feel like God really smiles on that. You know, the, Jesus Christ himself wanted to tell us, hey, you keep all the Lord's commandments. You do what you can in keeping them. But here's one that's really big in my heart is you take care of your neighbor. 
You love your neighbor as you love yourself. As a matter of fact, if you and I tonight, if we were to think about it, if we loved our neighbor as ourselves, the rest of the Ten Commandments wouldn't really be a problem now, would it? It truly wouldn't, wouldn't be hard. That's important for God. So when you and I are reaching out and, and praying on someone else's behalf, I honestly feel like the Lord's smiling down on us. He has to, amen. Because He really takes it serious when He told us to love your neighbor, amen. Repair your heart is what He's telling us tonight. If we could do, if, if we could do good, to use an example, to make... We should have a place and a time to pray daily. We truly should. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, it tells us, A new heart also I will give you, a new spirit I will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. The Lord is telling us there, if we have these stony hearts, if we have these prideful hearts, He'll help us with those. He truly does. He promised that in Ezekiel. As a Christian, we have to be very diligent to keep our hearts in step with the will of God. You know, it's kind of something you don't think about a whole lot, but you know, when the Lord says, take up my yoke, when you take up a yoke, it's an agreement that you have. It's not one of these things where you take up a yoke that just makes it all easy on you. And makes it, I mean, the Lord says, take up my yoke because my way is easy. Yes, of course it truly is. But the fact is, is if you've yoked up with somebody, if you yoked up with Christ, number one is you agree with Him on things. You're not going to disagree with the Lord if you're yoked up with Him. You won't be out of step of Him. That's kind of one of these things about what the Lord put in the Leviticus law is you don't yoke up a racehorse with an oxen because one of them will work the other one to death. Whoever's the heavy, heavier one will pretty much kill the other. You don't have them unequal. So when you're yoked up with Christ, you believe and you're on tune and you're in tune to, totally with Him. You and I yoking up with the Lord, our heart would be in tune with Him. How do you do that? With a soft heart, paramal heart, that's a repaired heart. It truly is. Every Christian ought to be diligent to be in the will of God through God, God's will, in step with God. We truly should. We should make sure we have nothing between our heart and the Savior's heart. You know, just like in Sunday school this morning, and we were talking about how as a church, as a Christian, it's our mission to go and be reaching out to others, doing what God would have us do. He truly would have us do these things, and that we should be reaching others, but we're in agreement with Christ. We really are. He gives us that heart. When we're saved, we, ha we end up having the heart of the Savior. We have the focus of the things that He would want for others. In Psalms 51, verse number 10, it says, Create in me a clean heart. O oh God, renew a right spirit within me. If we have heart trouble, we have problems in our heart, we have a mess in our heart, the Lord can clean that up for us. He really will. Amen. So tonight, I'll give it back to you in an application. I'll give you some questions here. Is tonight your night to get your heart right with God? Are there things in your heart that's between you and Him? I've said it many times. You know, you and I are in charge of how close we get to the King. Matter of fact, it's not really the things where He gets upset with us when we sin. It's those sin that creeps in that gets between Him and us. It's all on us. It truly is. What I love about the Lord is the way He tells us that all we have to do is ask for forgiveness and move on. Amen. That cleans our heart and we can get as close to Him as we want. Draw nigh, draw nigh unto Him. Amen. We can get as close as we want to Him. I want to get very close to Him. I really do. That should be your goal tonight. I just think of the long suffering of God had for Manasseh here. This paints us, this whole scripture night paints us a, 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 a wonderful portrait of God's grace. You know, God was so long suffering with Manasseh here. If it were me thinking in my carnal mind and thinking how I would do things, and it's probably not fair to say I would do this if I was. But, but the fact is, I don't think I could be long suffering like the Lord. I would have been like, uh uh, you ain't doing that to my chosen people, young man. It's not going to happen. And I would have zapped him. But God didn't do that. God was long-suffering to Manasseh. God blessed Manasseh in the fact that God pulled him in, changed his direction. Changed his direction to help his people as well as Manasseh. Aren't you glad God's long-suffering? He had that very wicked heart on a very wicked path to destruction, and yet God allowed the man to humble himself.
God didn't humble him. God put him in a situation where he had to humble himself. Amen. And God spared him. God didn't destroy him. He spared him. Boy, that's great grace of the Lord. Amen. Pinks is a picture of what he did in the New Testament by sending his only begotten son. Amen. This was a great display of God's mercy. Mercy. Like I said, he should have killed him right away. I, I just feel that way. But he didn't. God showed him grace. And I think of myself as a sinner too. There's, I, you know, all sinners are bad. All sin is bad. You know, God is long-suffering with us to put up with the things that he's put up with in, uh, with in us. He truly has. God has mercy for all that will humble themselves and come to Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful that God has all the mercy for us? And the thing that God will not run out of is mercy and grace for the ones that are whosoever, that part of that whosoever club. Amen goes there. Aren't you glad tonight? So I'll give it back to you tonight. Is tonight your night to get your heart right with God? Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for letting us be here, Lord. So grateful to be in your house, Lord, and around your people, Lord. Thank you for getting me through this scripture, Lord. I just ask for it to be clear and concise and things that make sense to help your people. These things, Lord, I ask in your Son, Jesus' most precious name. Amen. All right, Brother Don. Yeah, yeah, go that one. All right, amen. Grab your hymnal if you would. Let's stand up with me. Let's sing one hymn and we'll let you go home tonight. Page 306, Have Thy Own Way, Lord. All right, Brother Tommy, would you dismiss us?